Good evening. Welcome. This is Shudeep Sen in New Delhi, India. I'm co-hosting it with my friend and colleague. This is Fiona Sampson on the borders of Wales, but in England. And uh, we have a wonderful, wonderful lineup as we usually do. Each one is a uh, each session we've had so far. They're just just like master classes. And I'm really, really looking forward to this one. Fabulous uh, set of poets. And um, we'll be introducing each of you individually, of course. Please use the chat box on the side liberally. I've already put up the bios there, but feel free to show your books, put up links, websites, and so on. And keep a watch on the side because people ask questions or often we ask each other questions as well. So have a look there. Yes, it's a great privilege to be welcoming three more amazing international poets. And this time our, um, our loose theme is poetry and translation. I think one of the problems for the Anglophone world is because of our lazy relationship with language, not only do very few poets in this part of this, this not part of the world, it's quite a large part of the world, not, not only do very few Anglophone poets, relatively speaking, translate poetry, but those who do tend to be kind of tarred by that brush, which seems extraordinarily ironic because surely being interested in international poetry is a form of literary curiosity and a sign of poetic health. But it's certainly the case, isn't it? That I'm sure Shadit would bear me out on this, that a manner would too, that, um, Poetry translation is, is, a, is a burden that international poetry has to bear. And it shouldn't be, of course, because it's a creative act. It's an extra creative dimension. So our afternoon, this afternoon here, is going to be about celebrating these three poets who incidentally also work very closely and deeply with poetry and translation and literary translation in different ways. So they are in alphabetical order, Zoran Ancheski from Northern Macedonia, Jordi Doce from Spain, and Mena Elvin from Wales. And they are going to read in reverse alphabetical order, reverse alphabetical surname order uh, in the old fashioned way. And um, those of you who re are regulars will know that each poet reads for about 12 to 15 minutes. There's a little bit of informal discussion and then we move on. And then we have a sort of general discussion at the end. Um, please everybody, um, <laughs> normally in a live gig you say, please everyone make sure your mobile phone is switched off. In this case, please um, check that your mic is switched off and nest your reading. So our first poet is Mena Elvin and Shadeep, who is the maestro of many things, particularly poetry, but certainly also of CVs is going to introduce her, I believe. Oh. Am I? Okay, sure. <laughs> I've put the bio on the side in any case, so just follow it. Uh, Mena Elfin is an award-winning poet and has published 14 collections of poetry with Goma Press and Blood Axe Books. Her work has been translated into 18 languages and in 2021, Bondo, Blood Axe 2017, has just been published in Italian under the title Ludo, and the Spanish publication Tria published this month. Murmur 2012 Blood Axe was selected as the Poetry Book Society recommendation translation, the first book in Welsh English to be chosen. She has written libretti for UK and US composers and choral symphony. Garden of Light was performed by the New York Philharmonic Orchestra as part of the Millennium uh, Celebration in 1919, commissioned by Disney Corp. A literary memoir, Senad, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, traces her literary journey to festivals and residencies across the globe. She's also written numerous plays for stage, radio, and television, as well as documentaries. The latest publication of nonfiction, Sleep, appeared in 2019. She is Professor Emeritus at University of Wales, Trinity St. David, a fellow of the Royal Society of Literature, Royal Literary Fund Fellow, and Learned Society of Wales Fellow. 
a former children laureate for Wales. She's honorary president of Wales Pen and a columnist with Western Mail since 1995. And I Mena, just want to add that Mena is, um, as in my opinion, the leading poet writing in Welsh today. She's also, um, for me, the leading Welsh woman poet and a hugely inspirational figure who has transformed, I, I think we can say, writing in the language, who's uh, part of the language movement for Welsh and has changed um, what is written and published in Wales from um, a kind of division between the, the, the more international trends and Welsh language, very traditional forms, to a kind of integration where Welsh can now speak in any form it chooses. She's a hugely inspirational figure for me, and I'm just absolutely delighted she's joining us, Mena. Welcome, Mena. Looking forward. Well, thank you. You're too kind, far too kind. Um, <clears throat> of course, English is another Welsh language in Wales, so we accept that too. Um, and I will be reading in English translation mostly, but I will uh, read one poem in in Welsh in its entirety, so that you get the feel of the language. Um, so, Croeso, Adiolch, um, welcome and thank you. Croeso in Welsh means welcome. Croes means to cross, and I think both are um, apt. We're talking about crossing borders, crossing landscapes, and also languages. So I'm going to read about five poems, and uh, the first one is one that I I tend to read because it's about a door and it's about Epint. And Epint is a place in Mid Wales that was um, in many years ago, in 1940, in fact, the Second World War, people were told to leave the place so that they could have a firing range so that the Ministry of Defence could take over. And farms, schools, um, people, a pub, um, everybody had to leave and of course they never returned. But the woman, uh, one woman, turned to the army officer as she was leaving the place and said to him, can I please leave, can I please take my door with me? And I think that's a very important, uh, very, um, very apt thing to say in leaving your home. A door in Epint. There's a door which closes by itself, a door that eludes time, one knock and there's fighting talk. And although she lived in the back of beyond, this hearth was her harmony. It's underlay the chill of tranquility. No standoff or ford to cross, no enemy but the purchase order. A perfect place this for a squaddy's mess. Armed with warrants in haste, they remove the people from the land. Then the hills of refuge surrender to the combat's heavy outfits. Not without a plea, before turning her back, May I keep the door to the cottage? Empty handed, she left for the village. Yet when the east wind howls, I hear terror. The door slammed shut and then flung open. Listen to its sounds, earth shakes, pleading. Diara Grin, Gan Ervin. Those last two words there in Welsh comes from very early Welsh poetry and Welsh poetry, early Welsh poetry is full of people having to leave uh, their places, their homes and uh, all kinds of battles taking place. So that's the first poem, which is a rather sad poem. And yet we are trying to reclaim Epint uh, little by little. Epint means Apple, which means uh, a foal and hint away, so it's the way the horse is. My next poem is a simpler poem. It's a lockdown poem. We've all had to write lockdown poems, haven't we? And uh, one of them I wrote after hearing that children in the primary school had to hum happy birthday instead of singing. 
And I thought, what a wonderful way of remembering that humming came into the world before words, before language. Uh, we're going right back. And there is something quite magical about the idea of humming if you've been to singing festivals or choirs where the choir master says, now I want you just to hum. And the hum is something quite spectacular. So this is humming. And hum from meeting lips, sweet as the hum that hums, the Sumerians hum to creation, unmarked by the measure of Christ. Today, a child hears hum as the M melts a balm of notes and mouths muffle words or air. The boom voices still as Siogan soothes and hummingbirds sing their first fruit from nectar. Hum, hum. Humming is an instinct for harmony. From a murmur, melody defies the crashing breeze. Hum. On a wing and a prayer, 2020, our year. Lovely, beautiful. So we won't forget 2020, will we? And Igain uh, Igain Eleni. I'm very lucky with, with translators. Um, that was, was translated by Emma Baines. And of course, some of these poems, not that one, uh, have appeared in, in Blood Dags. I'm going to read next. Uh, I'm going to stay with children. And this is a poem translated by Damien Walford Davis uh, into English. It's about trees. Uh, we have a saying in Welsh, Dordiw Coi, to come to your trees. Um, and it used to be a thing my grandma used to say, if you've got a headache, go out to the trees, go out to the woods. But my children came back one day and said, we've been on the ship and we've been to sea. And what it was, it was a branch and a little stream where we lived, by, by the place where we lived. So this is about George Eau Coyd. I'm going to read the English first and then the Welsh in its entirety. Growth rings. See how kids bloom in the care of trees. Out of brown and green grow metaphors. A bone is a boat that bears them over a burn. A branch is a gangplank for storming a deck. The rug of Ramsons is a fizzy sea, nettles list in a rasp of wind. Compassionate, boughs bend to mend a fall, draw balm for the burn of bark. Out of a cut comes blood, into the groove, the girl walks out of the grove. Metaphors return to being trees, things to blunt our razor minds against. O fel a car a coed, blunt bychain, i glas enwi bnant, cangen yw'r llong sy'n i cario dros nant, grisiau tal yn cyrraedd dec, Ar mor i slaw yw dail y craf. Croeston dan ydl sy'n anadlu'r wig. Cymydog yw ambell frigyn, yn cod un wedi'r codwm, gwneud rhasal o eli o rhysgl. Brath a bryw wedyn, daw'r dyfod i oed. Rhaid wedi'r cyfan, rhoi coed yn ei lle. Hogfaen llon a'r llif mewn llaw. The next poem is going to be a political poem. Um, I, as you know, uh, have been a, a language activist. Uh, we had to fight for language rights, which we have succeeded uh, to a great extent. And uh, the hope is that by 2050, there'll be a million Welsh speakers, um, double what is now, or more than, almost a double more. Um, but I came across this, I love the way words collide. And I came across a word called nebish, which is a Yiddish word. 
or nebach, which means poor soul. But in Welsh, if you break it up, neb means no one, nobody, and ach means to belong. So it's nobody who belongs. And I was just thinking about the Welsh. I was also thinking about all those migrants, asylum seekers, um, all trying to find where they belong and whether they belong. And so I wrote this uh, after reading uh, uh, something by Barbara Kinsolver, who said, so many of us have stood up for the marginalized, but never expected to be here ourselves. And in Wales, you're used to the word small. We're very small. Everything about Wales is small. And of course, uh, we are spoken of as uh, by our English neighbours as strangers. That's our, yeah. what Welsh means. So this is about that and other things. What I learned early on, Bach small, smaller, smallest, but who is the smallest of us all? We thought it was us, the Welsh, appendage, some relic or other of England, sometimes quipped as Great Britain, though minuscule on any map. Welsh is the only language you learn to be able to talk to fewer people, said the one spin doctor or the journalist, this useless language though she could not sound even a syllable from her small world. Bigger, bigger, bigger is the curse that we hear. These days, the small and smaller are afoot, and we are with them, the smallest ones, dregs, whose here I for hearth wants a roof, eaves even, and blessings, who crave, though they be small, a feast, a dwelling, a plenitude, and we, like them, shy away from those who sense the leaves on our lips. After all, we Welsh were called strangers once by our next-door neighbours, so we understand those on the move, mumbling without the warmth of their mother tongue, glass water on a faraway beach, every shard hitting rock before it falls in the cauldron of tides. Until the great power reconfigure their dictionaries as the diminutive people, small, small, the smallest nebbish, and nobody, nebach, no lineage, smaller than small, poor thing, say some, as they bid or do to the whisper of the tiniest tribes and nations before slipping back to their huge worlds, larger than ever, ever, ever. And I'd finish, I'd finish with a, a love poem um, after that rather fierce poem, a political poem. And this is Love Not. And it came to me the way sometimes you need someone else to help you to put on a necklace. And so it's a love knot, literally. Um, and I've taken Gerda uh, Stevenson's wonderful line, Ilka Morn Old Loves a Hansel. <clears throat> this is uh, translated by Gillian Clark. Each morning, old love is a gift renewed. Like the necklace I can't fasten without love's help. The clasp and I don't let me believe I can fix it at the nape alone. It needs this ritual, the unison of two, the secret lock that lets the necklace lie on my breast, a hidden knot that binds two lovers. Through generations, this simple duty, this task, lover to lover, a moment's work for finger and thumb. Were they made, I wonder, these lovely beads in another age, so that this ritual for two would become 
common ceremony in cave or private chamber to find two parts at the nape, to see them linked, to caress in the act of closing, this orderly commitment. On one another, dependent as a necklace, love's need and pleads a chain, glowing beyond pearls, renewed, unbreaking. Mm, beautiful. Oh. I love that um, that um, the way you seize on things and just lightly turn them into a symbol. I've always felt that listening to you, your poetry, reading your poetry, that sense of something new is is made. You, you're a very observant poet, but you're not a descriptive poet. It's everything is seized and remade i suppose yeah. well, it's from a translation isn't it i mean you know mm -hmm. no i also love the way you control sound when beautiful i mean i love the line breaks and the sahuras and when i've been when i was reading your poems i mean i had to have the privilege of reading them before of course and uh, unlike so many other poems who use long lines and short lines in their poems indiscriminately Yours are so well calibrated and balanced tonally, I think. And when you, of course, you, when you read in Welsh, there's that lovely guttural sound. And one of the poems, I think, it was, was it what? Growth rings, tree rings? You, there was a lovely moment where you almost were mimicking the Caribbean accent as well. What's so, that? Oh, that's yeah, quite a sound <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. It was beautiful. But do t tell tell us tell us the whole aspect of uh, the acoustics. I mean, are you very very conscious of the use of sound? Clearly, that's how it comes comes across in the poems. And Mena, maybe you could also. So many people here won't know. Maybe you could talk a little bit about Welsh traditional form too, because yeah. it's so clear to me that that's that's there in your work. Uh, yes, well, you can't write poetry in Welsh without being aware of music, of sound, and of course, we still say in Welsh that we're composing poetry, as if we are making notes. Uh, I, I am a fairly musical person, a harpist, a uh, one-time harpist, and uh, um, so, uh, but, I, but Canghanedd is strict metre, it's, it's a way of putting lines together that uh, not only rhyme, but the consonants also have to chime. So it's mm. a very intricate way of, of putting poetry together. And I've used Ken Haneth, um, as a kind of underlay in my poetry. I've kind of resisted the very traditional forms that are very um, very exact and you have to be correct. And as um, a writer, I like to break rules, you know, it's a bit like it, with Ganghaneth, you would have to, if it was uh, to give you a swimming analogy, um, if you, you you have to go in, in lanes and I like the deep sea where you're in danger of not knowing, are you out of your depth or, you know, is there a, a wave going to come over you? So I, I like the, the open roads, the open form uh, but I respect more and more as the older I get I respect Kang um, whereas uh, in my 60s and 70s I was so restless and wanted and I, I wanted to write so m many things I didn't have time for craft and, and, and learning the rules there are 24 rules to uh, um, and there are four forms and there's a special way but now even modern poets young poets today are breaking the mold and they are also uh, doing away uh, with kind of very strict forms of Kanghanev but when I started writing uh, I was also becoming a feminist and with Kanghanev you needed a master to show you the way and no way was I going to have a master even though my dad, my father 
wrote in, in strict meter and could have taught me, but I, I wanted to break all rules. And I had so much to say in the 60s and 70s because we were fighting for the language, uh, the Vietnam War, um, drove me into writing poetry and, and writing songs. And I, I was in a, in, a, in a pop group, in a folk group. Uh, we even made a record, but uh, um, I wasn't uh, going to, I swapped the guitar and the harp for, for just for a pen, yeah. It's so interesting, isn't it? Because um, I'm certainly in the seventies, you know, feminism tended to, has tended to, I'm thinking of French feminism, has tended to think that the musicality of language is the feminine element in language, the body element, the semiotic, and yeah. that, you know, the masculine element is the naming, legislating, which of course I suppose is strict form, but of course, you know, there it is, the musicality, the return to musicality. Yes, and to rhythms. And if you look at Kristeva with her idea of, you know, a baby in the womb, that's the yeah. mother language. The mother language is there uh, to be born. And uh, yes, but um, I think my poetry has changed a great deal from the uh, very early uh, 70s. And I was writing about Angela Davis and, uh, and, and uh, Daniel Cobendit and all these kinds of uh, rebels uh, in that during that time and um, but and, and of course I went to prison a couple of times uh, for the language uh, for non-violent uh, offences I should add mm. yeah mm. proper heroin mm. proper cultural heroin no no I'm but uh, I think I, I found my way of still being a restless activist uh, through Penn International. So I have been writing poems to Ilan uh, Sami Komach, uh, for example, who was in Turkey, has been in prison for 27 years, and uh, I've been writing poems to him, and he's been writing some back. Uh, he's uh, an amazing poet, and and so many others, of course. So, so uh, I mean, you're always aware as a poet of the poets who aren't allowed to hear, have their voices heard. And so there's so much work to do there. Yeah, I noticed, I, I can see that Magda Karnic is here from who is the head of Romanian Pen until oh, recently. Yes. And yes. Yeah, you know, sure you know each other very well. And probably Magda, I don't know, Magda, did you want to say something about that? You know, that, that pen as the pen as a pen, you know, as writing to... I would like to say some words about Mena, whom I uh, know for a long time now. We met at several uh, literary festivals, and I was always impressed by her engagement, her political and uh, national engagement, I would say, for the Welsh language and culture. And coming from a more stabilized country with a communist uh, past, uh, I was impressed of, of this kind of topics and of her energy to do that. And um, uh, I think she, she influenced me in this, and uh, in, in, in this energy to put herself into tasks common, co collective tasks. Uh, and I would like to ask her a question, uh, oh. if it's possible, yes. uh, really? about the, the relationship uh, between Welsh language and English language in herself. How does she manage between, how does she feel her poems translated into English? Is it the same when she writes in English or in Welsh? Um, this kind of things, if possible. Oh, that's a very good question. I'm not sure I can answer it fully, but I, I can only write poetry in Welsh. It's that, a very primal language almost. It's kind of, um, it's as it is my first language, but intellectually, I love the English language. And of course, I've been teaching English um, through other people how to write in English at the university, uh, creative writing, PhDs, and masters, and so forth. So I was. I think because I was only given an English education, I kind of didn't want to write in English because Welsh was my, uh, it was my private language, which of, co of course became a very public language through poetry. Um, but I do write um, 
some articles and books. I've written academic books in English, and that's fine because it's a different kind of, of, of writing. It's an intellectual kind of writing uh, that, I, um, that I'm happy to do. Um, but I am aware, and more and more people are asking me, when are you going to write in English? In fact, um, he's not listening, I don't think, but Horatia Clare told me last week, why didn't you write a... Uh, why don't you write a memoir? You, nobody writes prose like you. It's a kind of jazz. But I think it's because um, I write as I speak. It's, if it's like jazz, that's a, that's, I'm not sure that's quite a compliment because it means I'm, I'm always just one word away from Welsh when I'm writing um, something very personal um, in you know, in, in creatively, but intellectually, I, I'm I can write in English articles, which I do, and um, other books. I have written educational books in English um, for different organisations. Does that answer you? No, not really. But uh, that's such a fascinating answer too, isn't it? That sense of syncopation that you know. One of the languages is off the beat and the other is perhaps on the beat or... Yes, exactly, you know, different between, you know, sort of classical music and, and, and jazz, um, whereby you're only just in control, um, and perhaps out of control very often, <laughs> I'd be in jazz and just go with it, yeah. And actually I noticed Zoran nodding as you were saying that, and Zoran, I mean, you, you know, you, you too come from a bilingual country and you too are making space for language. I mean, how many speakers of Macedonian are there? Uh, I believe about a million, um, I think it's a million, million two hundred six thousand. However, there's more scattered all over the world, I believe, I don't know, around two million perhaps. And um, I would say we're not bilingual. I mean, um, um, in Macedonia, Macedonian is official, Albanian is also there. Uh, however, being in such a, a context, a previous context in former Yugoslavia, uh, most of my generation, at least of people, could speak Serbo-Croatian and Macedonian equally well. Uh, however, the situation has changed after the, 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 the fall of Yugoslavia. Now, my son, for example, can hardly speak any other Yugoslav language, not to mention mm. Slovenian or Croatian. Okay. So uh, th these more recent generations have resorted to the usage of English. So the youngsters now, uh, if they try to, to learn another language very well, they do well in that language, that's English, rather than other Slavic languages anymore. So you had your education in, in what was then serbo croat No, 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 no. Ma Macedonian has been official since the creation of, of uh, uh, Yugoslavia. Uh, recognized as an official language in Macedonia. So all education I had was in Macedonian. However, we had the, uh, other uh, languages on the programs, the curriculum, uh, so that Serbo-Croat, as it was called then, was the, uh, a language that we, that we studied at, at school, right. like four hours per week. Or, you know. However, being exposed to the Yugoslav media, which was uh, primarily in this, uh, let's say, lingua franca, which is now, nowadays non existent, Serbo Croat. In those, uh, nowadays, it's Serbian and Croatian as distinctly different languages, although they're very similar. But in those days, we could communicate all over Yugoslavia in, in, in this lingua franca, uh, Serbo Croat, so to speak. But Macedonian, Macedonian was the language of education, and of course, uh, it was uh, spoken all over the country. As, as, uh, as a language, uh, I mean, uh, uh, official language of the country. Mm. I've never tried to write in any other language but Macedonian because I believe that uh, I, I did try to write in English for a while, but I believe that the deepest thoughts and the deepest feeling uh, could find wording only in the mother tongue. So uh, I gave up the idea of writing in English. So I resorted to writing in, in Macedonian. When it comes to translation, however, uh, I do the translation by myself with the help of friends, including Shudik, one of them. We did try and translate it very well. Some of my poems, which um, one of the few I will eventually translate. 
Thank you, Zoran. <laughs> Just quickly before we leave Serba Kurat, I wondered whether uh, Miłosz Jerzevic, the Croatian poet who's reading later in the series, wanted to say anything. Miłosz, did you want to say anything? Oh, well, I don't know how we're supposed to go in this quite different direction since we got a we don't uh, have to, no. great opportunity to hear Mina and the, her Welsh language. Uh, right. For good or for bad, we are, we are not in the same country and uh, that's it. <laughs> so, uh, Thank you, Mimush. Thank you. So, yes. So, so Mena. So, Shadit, did you want to um, ask Mena anything? Yeah. before we move uh, no, on? No, no. We, we, we'll get back to that. I'm also, I have my um, eye on the clock. So, we have to be, you know, efficient with that as well. Uh, but, um, yeah, as she said, uh, there's so many lines which sort of are embedded in my head. She's just one word away from Welsh. We are one word away from Spanish with Jordi <laughs> coming up. And um, yeah, and Jordi will make the consonants chime, as Mena said. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank Jody, you so much, Mena. Uh, yeah. uh, I've put the bio on the side, but I'll read it formally in any case. Jordi Doce was born in 1967. My God, you're terribly young. He's the author of six yeah. volumes of poetry. <laughs> Uh, which was chosen as the best um, poetry book of 2016 by the literary weekly El Cultural and has been recently published in the UK by Shearsman Books. We were not there in 2019. As was his previous volume, Nothing is Lost, Selected Poems 2017, both translated by Lawrence Schimmel. He lived in England from 1992 to 2000, where he worked as language assistant at the University of Sheffield and the University of Oxford, where he wrote an emphatic thesis on the work of English poet Peter Redgrove. Now living in Madrid, he's the poetry editor at Galaxia Gutenberg Publishers. He has translated the poetry of W.H. Auden, John Burnside, Anne Carson, T.S. Eliot, Charles Simic, and Charles Tomlinson, amongst others, and is the author of two books of aphorisms and three book-length essays on influence of English Romanticism in Spanish modern poetry. The work of T.S. Eliot and W.H. Uh, Auden and contemporary English and American poetry. His poems and aphorisms have appeared in the Triquarterly, Verseville, Agenda, Fourth Genre, amongst many others. Jordi, it's a real pleasure to have you here. It's a great pleasure and honor to have you here, Jordi. And um, yeah, I can't wait to hear you. I've never heard you read. I can't wait. Uh, well, good afternoon. Well, good morning, good evening, because I think we are all in different uh, time zones, but um, well, it's a great pleasure to be to be here. Thank you, uh, Fiona and Sadiq, for your wonderful and generous invitation. Thanks, uh, Donald, for your um, you know for all this technical expertise needed to to you know have us on board on the screen. And and I'm you know I feel honored to to be reading along uh, uh, Men Alvin, who uh, you know. I, I, I read while I was living in, in the UK more than 20 years ago. So when, when you say I'm terribly young, uh, it's a bit of a euphemism. And in any case, don't ask my, my family about it. And, uh, and obviously I'm, you know, um, very, very, also very honored to, to be reading with uh, Zoran Anteski, um, whose poetry, I. I I came across a few poems of his uh, uh, some time ago, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, him read. Um, I'm just going to read, a, a, you know, just I think four or five poems because I have to read it both in English and in Spanish. Um, but, but I want to say something beforehand. Um, all the poems, is, I think, for at least for a couple of pieces, are taken from that book you mentioned. Uh, we were not there. No estábamos allí which was already published five years ago. And, um, um, and I think uh, if I had to link all these different poems um, um, to a single mood or, or, or to a single notion, 
or a poetic idea, that would be the notion of disorientation. Um, and I think the characters in these poems um, are people who do not really know what has what happens to them, what has happened to them, or why. You know, they 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 seem like casualties from something that uh, happened when they were not there, and that's you know that that's I think the sense the, the meaning of the uh, of the title, something they they did not witness, and um, uh, it's also something which is out of their control, but which has distinct. Uh, uh, consequences on their lives, and I think I think this is something we can relate to in, in a way. You know, the feeling that basically we are living lives which are influenced by events that we don't really control, um, and that's more and more the case on a global uh, level. Obviously, uh, a middle-aged peasant had very little control of his his or her lives uh, too, but uh, now it's it's a bit different. Um, and so in that particular sense, I think that the characters in these poems are a bit like correlates of this sense of unease and of uncertainty in which we live. And I think the, 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 the pandemic, the, you know, the, the crisis that we've been going through for the past year and um, the lockdown and all that, you know, uh, has just, um, I think, underlined that feeling, you know, in a very, in a very uh, strong way. Uh, but anyway, enough chattering. And, uh, I will read the poems. I'll read the English first, um, so you get a, a sense of you know what they are up to, of their meaning, and then you I read the Spanish, so you can also have a sense of the uh, music, um, uh, which is as I said before, slightly narrative. Though there are a few, you know, two or three poems which are more lyrical. Uh, in any case, the first one is called Incident, and that's. You know, it, it, it contains the line with, from which the title in, of the book is taken. We were not there. Incident. We were not there when it happened. We were on our way to another city, another life, under a changing sky that moved with us. We crossed fields, then yellow, towns of suspicious people and impassive crows, crows, and not once did we miss our home or feel nostalgia for the past. That's how the journey was, at night silence in the morning mist. Once I found a tin button in my pocket and played at holding it under the sun, throwing glimmerings onto the tall crops. Later, it was a used coin and we had free passage at every checkpoint. The plains of Europe are our witnesses. They also know that something happened, although we never saw it. We were on our way to another country, another life, with neither flamboyant luggage nor room for memories. Everything opened before us, now silent and later missed. I should perhaps say that the translations, as I, uh, Sadeep said, are by uh, American, but, you know, based in Madrid, uh, writer and translator Lawrence Schimmel. Uh, there, there are also the work of collaboration, and, and we can talk about it uh, later on. Suceso. No estábamos allí cuando ocurrió. Íbamos de camino a otra ciudad. Otra vida, bajo un cielo cambiante que se movía con nosotros. Cruzamos campos verdes, amarillos, pueblos de gente suspicaz y cuervos impasibles, y ni una vez echamos en falta nuestra casa o sentimos nostalgia del pasado. Así era el viaje. Por la noche, silencio, a la mañana niebla. Una vez encontré un botón de hojalata en el bolsillo y jugué a sostenerlo bajo el sol, arrojando destellos a las altas espigas. Luego fue una moneda usada y tuvimos el paso franco en todos los controles. Las llanuras de Europa son testigo. Ellas saben también que algo ocurrió. 
aunque nunca lo viéramos. Íbamos de camino a otro país, otra vida, sin bultos estridentes, sin lugar para el recuerdo. Todo salía a nuestro paso. Ahora silencio y luego niebla. Bravo. Thanks. Wide awake on the edge of the world. It was the time of the new austerity. Shattered glass in the shop fronts and whistling through faces that mirrors couldn't grasp and words stained by hunger. Dogs came and went through the neighborhood, imitating the grotesque shapes of the trees. The wandering drew a forest of scents, and deep in the heart of the forest, a shining temple filled with birds we'll never hear. Everyone came out with suitcases. We were in transit, in no mood for travel. Far from the suspicion of the yards, the sky offered incomprehensible equations like the language of lovers. Often the sun shone by its absence. Often we made it shine in dreams. Every day for a year, letters arrive from undiscovered places, blank letters for my dead father. And the postman at dawn's first light rested on a bench at the corner to quench his thirst in the insistent fog that nipped at his footsteps. Con los ojos abiertos a la orilla del mundo. Fueron los tiempos de la nueva austeridad. Lunas rotas en los escaparates y el viento atravesando los relojes. Rostros que los espejos no apresaban y palabras manchadas por el hambre. Los perros iban y venían por el barrio imitando las formas grotescas de los árboles. En sus paseos dibujaba una selva de aromas y al fondo de la selva un templo reluciente lleno de pájaros que nunca oiríamos. Todo el mundo salía con maletas. Estábamos en tránsito, sin ganas de viajar. Lejos de la sospecha de los patios, el cielo planteaba ecuaciones incomprensibles, como el habla de los amantes. Muchas veces el sol brilló por su ausencia. Muchas veces lo hicimos brillar en sueños. Cada día, durante un año, llegaron cartas de lugares por descubrir Cartas en blanco para mi padre muerto. Y el cartero con las primeras luces descansaba en un banco de la esquina para calmar su sed en la niebla insistente que mordía sus pasos. Um, I had a thing for, for years with um, uh, poems that uh, talked about objects, about things. Um, those things, uh, the mind, uh, you know, in, in many Alvin's poems, not the mind um, gets blunt, you know, against those things. And the most, the simplest thing in the world is a stone, you know, and I always had the project of um, uh, editing an anthology, uh, uh, collecting poems about the stones, um, and there are, there are quite many of them. Uh, I remember that particular poem by the Polish poet uh, Zbigniew Herbert, um, uh, which is particularly striking. It's a very simple piece. And I, and I wanted to add uh, my contribution to that imaginary anthology. It, it might not be imaginary after all in a few years time. Uh, so this is the poem, The Stone. I came to be close to the stone, the stone that waits in any path, anonymous and loyal, that saw suns, planets endure, remote marvels, that suffered the punishment of fickle winds and was stripped clean, simply dwindling, neglecting its own boundaries through the centuries, 
mumbling in dreams with a full mouth. The stone that was within itself struggling to bloom. The stone that little by little became a lump, a granule, the dust of dross that the air carries far away and drops here where there is no path, dressed in my clothes and speaking in my name. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thanks, Edith. Piedra. Vine para estar cerca de la piedra. La piedra que aguarda en cualquier camino anónima y fiel, que vio durar soles, planetas, prodigios remotos, que sufrió el castigo de vientos volubles y fue deshojándose, menguando sencillamente, descuidando sus confines por los siglos de los siglos, balbuciendo en sueños, con la boca llena. La piedra que estaba dentro de sí misma, luchando por aflorar. La piedra que poco a poco se convirtió en grumo, en grano, en polvo de escoria que el aire se lleva lejos y desciende aquí donde no hay camino, vistiendo mis ropas y hablando en mi nombre. No, no, if I'm... I think I still have time for another poem or... Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. yes, please. Lots, yeah. lots of time. Jody, yeah. before I forget, it might slip my mind. You must yeah. do the anthology of stone poetry. Not because yeah. I've ever written one, but I've taken lots of photographs of stone in different parts of the world. And you must read uh, Fiona's wonderful, wonderful book of nonfiction, The Limestone Country. It's yeah. one of her best works. Even well, though she's a so in the English tradition. Beautiful, uh, beautiful, beautiful book. I remember in, in, in Sheffield, my, my um, lecturer with whom I worked at the time, Neil Roberts, who, who has written a, a few books of criticism, had this poster on the wall with a poem by Charles Tomlinson, which were all the different sorts of stones that you could find uh, on a beach. And uh, it was a striking piece too. This is a long, a longish poem. Uh, it's called Fiction and it's a fiction. It's, a, it's I think it's a poem, it's a particularly um, perhaps anguished poem. I, I wish I could have more tonal variety like uh, Menos poetry, you know, th these are, very much in the same in the same vein. Fiction. I didn't want to open the door, nor for it to open before me. The keyhole was all I needed to pass through to the other side and see the house where time was buzzing in the kitchen and we heard in the distance the sea's obstinacy, the obedient crunch of the sand and then after night fell, how the curve of the lights that led to the lighthouse twisted like a question for you to answer. No one, nothing. I wake with fear and the fear keeps me alert. Why this anguish that insists in the hallways? Perhaps we loved one another gently without saying much. And in the living room, photos of a fictitious life surrounded us, that we remembered in turns, never in the same order, until one morning, when the world begged for dawn, a steaming scrap of cold skittered across the roof and traced a cross on this door, the door that led nowhere. We walked to open sky in the middle of the beach, and it was as if we'd slept since the beginning of time between the seagulls, screeches, and the reek of saltpeter. I didn't want to open the door, nor ask that it be opened. Beyond it, I write, I've died, I'm still living. Ficción. No quise abrir la puerta ni que se abriera para mí. Me bastó el ojo de la cerradura para pasar al otro lado y ver la casa donde el tiempo era un zumbido en la cocina y nosotros oíamos al fondo la obstinación del mar 
el crujir obediente de la arena. Y luego por las noches, cómo la curva de las luces que llevaban al faro se retorcía en forma de pregunta para que respondieras, nadie, nada, me despierto con miedo y el miedo me mantiene alerta. ¿Por qué esta angustia que insiste en los pasillos? Tal vez nos queríamos suavemente, sin decirnos gran cosa, y en el salón nos rodeaban fotos de una vida ficticia que recordábamos por turnos y jamás en el mismo orden. Hasta que una mañana, cuando el mundo pedía amanecer, un harapo humeante del frío se escurrió por el techo y dibujó una cruz en esta puerta, la puerta que daba a ningún sitio. Despertamos a cielo abierto, en mitad de la playa. Y era como si hubiéramos dormido desde el principio de los tiempos, entre el chillar de las gaviotas y el olor a salitre. No quise abrir la puerta ni pedir que se abriera. Tras ella escribo, he muerto, sigo viviendo. Um, I see that uh, Menas reading started with the door. So that was also, and, and doors are important. Um, too little has been said about the doors and how they allow us to go from one place to the other. Um, and translation in a way is opening a door. So um, I think it's a very um, pertinent uh, symbol. And I'm, I'm just finishing um, with uh, a short poem Um, which had a, an epigraph, uh, which was simply Starman. Uh, uh, I don't think I had Bowie's song, uh, it just came afterwards, but I thought it was a nice clarification. It, 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 I think it allows, it allows the reader um, to, to, to get the meaning of the, of the poem. He knew how to see the world as if he wasn't in it. Oblivion, indifference, These were his traits, also piety sometimes, a strange tenderness. The pilot blinked sometimes unwillingly, nothing that should trouble him. According to plan, urgencies were needless. Nonetheless, he felt an echo of the old ties. Something shifted blindly there inside. He corrected a word of his report and began to wait. He continued waiting while the earth kept on turning. If the pieces had to fit together, he didn't see how. Sabía ver el mundo como si no estuviera en él. Olvido, indiferencia, estas eran sus señas. También piedad a veces, una extraña ternura. El piloto parpadeaba a ratos, con desgana, no era cosa que debiera inquietarle. Según el plan en curso, sobraban las urgencias. Sin embargo, sentía un rastro de los antiguos vínculos. Algo se removía a tientas allá adentro. Corrigió una palabra de su informe y se puso a esperar. Siguió esperando mientras la tierra giraba. Si las piezas debían encajar, él no veía cómo. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Jordi. And thank you. I don't, I don't know why you worry about this homogenous tone, because what you're doing is opening up a particular world, a particular mm. sensibility, but a particular imaginative world. Um, yes, I, I think that... But I think that that, that was the, the, the I, I chose the poems because I, I really wanted to, you know, um, you only read five or six poems at the most. So you want to also to give a, you know, at least a, a single notion, you know, and not not go in many directions. Um, and I'm still young, so I, I still have time <laughs> to develop, Sadeep. <laughs> Indeed. You know, one of the things that also struck me, I have a lot of lot of things to say, but one of the things that struck me was just the Your, the, the translations are excellent. I mean, I don't know Spanish that well or remotely that well. Mm. I understand it a little bit, but 
but the English translations are so sharp and pitch perfect. And when I was hearing you in Spanish, the tonal quality of both the English and the Spanish was so close to each other. So I was wondering whether you in fact work very closely with your Spanish translator. Well, I, I think, um, I mean, you know, the, the, um, the merit is, is, is entirely Lawrence because he, were, he had the last word and he, in each case, he, he took the last decision. So, you know, he, he always knew what was right for the, for the poem. But I, I always had, when I, when I was younger still, you know, um, difficult to believe, um, I remember reading that, uh, um, an interview with uh, Normus, uh, Norman Thomas Di Giovanni, who was Borges' first translator. And, and he went to Buenos Aires, to Argentina, and he, and he basically went up to Borges' house and he said, I want to translate your poems into English. And Borges said, oh, wonderful, wonderful, you know, come along. And Borges knew a lot of English, but he had this notion that his poems in English had to sound very, very, very Anglo-Saxon. So, you know, a lot of plosives and fricatives and very harsh sounds, you know. I wanted to, I, I wanted to sound very, very um, Germanic, you know, as far away from Latin as is possible. And, and, and something like that happened to me, I'm not comparing to myself to Borges, but every time Lawrence came up with a line that sounded uh, too lat Latinate, you know, I said, oh, can we make it a bit more Germanic? I wanted to make it very foreign, you know, very, very, I had this idea that uh, uh, Latin wasn't part of the English um, ADN, you know, uh, DNA, DNA. So, um, so, which was a stupid notion. So, uh, fortunately, uh, Lawrence um, helped me see the light of day and we, we reach, I think, a very, a very nice agreement. Um, but and I think it, it worked. It worked better, I think, in this book than in the previous anthology, because um, the poems, my earlier poems were, were more formal, were more musical, were perhaps more um, classical in a way, you know. And so it was more difficult to, to carry them across the English language. And I mean, the fact that you are a distinguished translator yourself means presumably that not only Lawrence is a great translator, but the quality of your dialogue is going to be different. It's very interesting, that thing about Germanic language, isn't it? Because when we teach creative writing in this country, we tend to encourage, as I'm sure you know, we tend to encourage Tyro poets towards a Germanic vocabulary because we think of it as more inhabited, more sensual, and the Latinet is more yeah. Distraction. Obviously, when I came to to the UK in in 1992, but I've been obviously I studied English uh, literature and and I had read obviously a lot of English and, and American poetry. But in 92, you know, the poets, the 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 the, the great contemporary living poets were. Uh, same as Heaney and, um, and Ted Hughes and uh, obviously Sylvia Plath too, but you had all these big names, the favor list, you know, and they were all, most of them, very, very uh, Germanic in the, you know, it was like uh, Ted Hughes' is classic example, you know, it's, it's a very uh, harsh sounds, you know, dark vowels and, and the whole thing just, so um, I guess I wanted to, to you know, to, to, um, get as close to that idiom as possible. Um, but um, obviously there's, there's also the, uh, the, the Latina, the French uh, root, and, uh, and, uh, and that also I think is, is um, embodied in these translations. Um, my, my own feeling is that um, my mom is French and, and, and actually I'm, I'm half French, half Spanish. And my, mother, my first mother tongue until I went to primary school was French. So what happens is that um, uh, when I started writing in Spanish, um, I, I felt a, a bit of insecurity because I always felt, I always feared that French would uh, contaminate my Spanish, you know, which is a, 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 a mortal um, um, sin. In, uh, in Spain, you know, because um, the French influence is almost like, uh, even politically, 
for for centuries was almost uh, you know forbidden. So uh, I had to cleanse my Spanish from uh, all you know any taint from the French language. So I became a purist when I was in my twenties. Luckily, I'm saying this because I, when men I was talking about the, the English uh, Welsh you know divide, I, I somehow I, I I felt a kinship there. So I, I became a very uh, Spanish purist. Uh, and now I, I, when I was translating the poems, when, when Lawrence was translating the poems into English, I became a Germanic purist. I don't know. I, I go to extremes. Uh, this mu must be me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, Mena, did you want to say anything in response to that? No, but I, I identify with everything that was uh, said about, you know, language and Germanic and Latin. Of course, Welsh, we've got a thousand Latin words in Welsh, and we are the only nation in Britain who has an inkling of what it was to be part of the Roman Empire. So, you know, uh, there is that influence there. So, yes, that, that struggle. But I think it's in the tensions between language that something happens, and I think it's good. That's why I, 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 I feel sorry for people, I don't mean this in a demeaning way, uh, for people who have only one language. Oh, I loved listening to the Spanish because I'm, I keep on relearning Spanish all the time and then, uh, you know, falling uh, by the wayside. But uh, I think it's just wonderful the way languages collide and, and you know, sort of rub against one another and, and the way you have to work through all that. Yeah. Well, now I'm all for uh, contamination, you know, and, and cross pollination yeah. between. <laughs> when I was in younger, when I was in my twenties, I, I, I felt some somewhat insecure, you know. I, I thought, well, you know, they're they're, they're going to um, find me out, you know. I'm I'm going to be betrayed by my Spanish, you know, and and, and some Gallicism, some French isms will. Um, contaminate my language. Anyway, that, that, that's it. It might not be relevant, but there's a wonderful kind of listening quality to the way you read, actually in both languages. And that makes one think that the poetry itself has a kind of listening quality, a, well, a quality of attention, which obviously all poetry has a quality of attention. But do you know what I mean? Are you well, aware of that in yourself? I think, I think what happens, uh, what, what, what happened basically was that when I was uh, writing my early poetry, I, I, I wrote it when I was living in, in England, basically, because um my you know from 92 to 2000 uh i was living most most of the time and teaching in, in england and i didn't really have the chance to read my poetry aloud and so the poetry i was writing at the time was a very literary poetry um uh, which means that I'm, I'm quite pleased with it in, in, the, in, the, in the sense that i think it it works as poetry but what happened when I started reading it, when I came to Spain in, 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 in the first decade of, of the century, uh, I started being invited to festivals and, and poetry readings, which I hadn't done before. And suddenly I found myself having to read poems, which um, had been very much written uh, for, for, for the eye, not so much for the ear. And, um, and so, um, I felt that I had to change my my way of almost my way of writing, you know, and, and, and write a more direct, more rhythmical, more I don't know, uh, trying to create a connection with the reader, with the audience. Obviously, not in a you know, I'm not obviously this, this is not a spoken poetry, it's not uh, rap, it's not nothing like that, you know. It's a very um, almost narrative poetry, if you will, if you will, but. I really had to make a, a connection and open up the lines of poetry. Uh, and because uh, it used to be much more, you know, closed in and, and much more, I think, I tended to overwrite perhaps. And, and now I tend to simplify things. And I think it's a consequence of having to read aloud and having to do, you know, poetry readings and trying to, to establish that connection I hope I hope I'm being. You're being absolutely, and it's, I think we're all nodding. There's something okay, very okay. recognisable, I think, about that. Isn't there something also about, you know, the young poet who's all fireworks, and mm. then there's a kind of kind of coming into yourself 
where you don't need to show off quite so much. You don't realize you're showing off. That's right. But a kind of entering into, I don't want to say sincerity because it's such a downbeat term, but you know. Well, yeah, so uh, you, you, you learn to, to, to be more economical, to be more subtle, perhaps. Um, when I'm reading my, my poem, the way, but it's, I'm trying to be too clever sometimes, or it's, oh, I'm trying to pack too many things in, in, in a single stanza or in a few lines. You know, I'm trying to pack too many things. And, uh, and obviously when you are reading that aloud, uh, and for the audience to, when, when they listen that for the first time, it, it doesn't really sink in, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah. You know, the list of, the list of poets the, of France. The listening Lincoln. aspect is very, very, very Excuse Jordi, me? Uh, I said, Jordi, the list of poets yes. you've translated, I mean, obviously it clearly, yes. part of it is influenced by the time you were in England, when I read the roster of names, clearly. Of course. Because those poets who were sort of in a very limited spectrum, white, male, of a certain yeah. kind of poetry, to me quite unipolar in many ways. But in that list, apart from say Charles Simich, who's a very different kind of poet, Anne Carson stands out because Anne Carson hmm. shares the language with the English poet, but her language, because you were talking about this triumvirate thing about the ear, hmm. the eye and the tongue. And you're writing poetry for the eye, even though both to Fiona and me, I think the listening quality was very, very, high on the scale of um, the triumvirate, so to speak. Hmm. Now, when you, you can answer this question in terms of why you chose Anne Carson, obviously you like her poetry, but in many ways, her poetry is very, very difficult. You have to kind of really tune into her poetry before you can sort of get the clues and so on. And also when you look at her poetry, most of her poetry on the page, it's very fragmented and almost Sappho-like in a sense. So perhaps you want to tell us why Anne Carson, because that sort of stands out in terms of structural, um, mm. the aspect of structural poetry. Yes, uh, well, Anne Carson was partly, um, I had read her in, in the 1990s. I, I remember uh, buying the uh, autobiography of Red and the Beauty of the Husband, which were published by Cape. I very distinctly remember those covers because I have them here actually. Um, and 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 I, I'm always drawn to original voices. Somebody who is completely off the wall in a way, you know, and completely original. And and uh, um, I don't think she can be imitated. Uh, she can be. You can perhaps follow her example and be a bit, you know, try to 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 write in different ways. But um, in this particular case, it was. Uh, I think what attracts me from translation or translation is the possibility of being someone else altogether. Uh, it's, it's almost like uh, an actor um, of, um, of being, I mean, sometimes you translate a poet uh, because you feel a kinship and you feel close to the things that happen in those poems. I mean, for instance, uh, I, I recently translated a few poems from uh, Fiona's latest book, and uh, and I translated those poems because th there was a sense of kinship in in some of the Gothic elements, you know, the the, the attraction to nature, but the way that you know the, the landscape and the characters that move through that landscape work. So there is a kinship there. But sometimes you translate because. Uh, you want to be somebody else altogether. That happened to me when I translated Charles Simic's poetry because it had a, an element of black humor, which I find very appealing personally, but which I couldn't really express in my poems. So you think, okay, I, I'm, I'm translating this because it allows me to express perhaps a, a, a facet of my own personality, which doesn't really, you know, find expression in the poems, in my own poems. And sometimes you translate people because you're, you know, you find them tremendously original, tremendously different, and a challenge. Uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a real challenge. Um, 
and and in this particular case it was a mixture of a, a personal attraction to the to the book which was um, um man in the off hours the first book i translated uh but also because it was a commission you know uh, i normally don't accept commissions you know I, I never have never translated a poet because i have been asked to i only only translate what i feel i can i can do in a in a proper way uh, but in this particular case it, it was a nice commission you know it, i was attracted to the to her way of working so I think uh, all the pieces fit fit in. I think, um, but um, um, I, I've done three books by her, and the last float was such a nightmare. I'm not going to repeat the experience. I mean, I found her. I find her very, very interesting and and sometimes dazzling, but this last book was such such a challenge that it really, uh, you know, it, I I thought. <laughs> I need to get two more <laughs> approachable. Uh, <laughs> anyway, Knox Knox was also difficult. Yes, moment. Knox. Uh, somebody else is. The, the problem with Anne Carlson is that she, she's become too big here in Spain. Yeah. So yeah. everybody wants a piece of the cake. Everybody wants to translate, and I don't want to uh, enter a rat's race. You know, um, I've done two books and a half. Uh, I've enjoyed them immensely. Um, but uh, it's become too complicated commercially with agents uh, in the middle. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, in that particular case, it's not very fun anymore because um, yeah. it's become a bit of a, a rat's race, as you say. I guess we are probably going to have to watch the clock again, yeah. but just wanted to draw our attention collectively back to Geordie's own poetry and how astonishing his reading was and to say, Thank you very much, Jordi. That was just an astonishing kind of refreshment in the middle of the afternoon. Real, a real joy. Just amazing. Thank you. I'm, and, I'm glad. and I know that um, Shadif is now going to in, introduce our friend, the wonderful poet, Zoran Anchevsky. Zoran, Shadif. Yeah, I just want to echo the thanks as well. It's here, it's nearly 10 at night. So the mood of your poetry sits beautifully. I wish I had opened a glass of wine, a bottle of wine, you know. It would have shown you nothing for me. <laughs> well, thank you. Wonderful. Thank, thank Zoran, you. what do we say about Zoran? I think, first of all, he is, of course, a dear friend of both Fiona and me. I met Fiona, in fact, at Stuttgart. 30, 30, 40 years ago. You know, since no. We're so <laughs> <laughs> no. I wish, but no. <laughs> yeah, whatever. When it seems like a long time. Uh, at the Struga uh, poetry evenings, the the only modern poetry festival that's been consistently going on since whenever it started, you know. So and and those were different times, I think, you know, historically different times. The Balkan politics were very very different. We're talking about Balkans, if there has to be a pillar of Balkan poetry, you're going to taste one coming up right now. I think both as a poet, as a professor, as a mentor, and as and as, a, as a translator of some of the most important uh, poets of the world, Zoran Anchevsky's really contributed so much uh, that you know his 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 poetry should be sung aloud even more. I uh, put his bio, of course. Uh, another young poet, born only <laughs> 1954. They're getting younger day by day, clearly. Zoran Anchevsky is a poet, translator, essayist, and a university professor. He's published eight books of poetry that have been awarded by major international and national and international awards, including the National Poetry Award for his book of poems, Celestial Pantomime, 2018, and the International Poetry Award, Giacomo Leopardi in Italy, 2004. Selections from his poetry have been translated into more than 20 languages and published in various magazines, anthologies at home and abroad. He lives and works in Skopje, the Republic of Northern Macedonia, North Macedonia, and his new book of uh, poems, Puzzled Compasses, what a fabulous name, Puzzled Compasses will be published this year. Zoran, 
the entire Balkan and the world floor is yours. Welcome. <laughs> thank you very much, Lee. And uh, thank you, uh, Fiona, for inviting me to this uh, conference. Um, as the title of this reading is somehow related to translation as well. Zoran, Zoran, you need to, uh, the audio is uh, uh, fluttering a bit, perhaps mm -hmm. you may. Yeah. All right. How is it now? Better. Much better. Yeah. Much better. Okay. Perhaps I was fiddling with the knob here uh, uh, or the earphone. Uh, all right. So as the uh, title of this uh, gathering tonight is uh, uh, related to translation, uh, I have uh, uh, prepared a poem that I've read on many occasions about translation, uh, but it's still in demand, I believe. So uh, that is my poetical statement. Uh, on translation, which I took very seriously in my life and uh, have, built, have still been struggling with various authors. I squandered my youth and my <laughs> adulthood on translation, writing and teaching as well. So um, I'm not going to make a, a lengthy introduction to uh, my experiences with uh, various poets I translated. Instead, I will start reading immediately and make the statement by uh, by giving you uh, the first poem that I'm going to read, which is simply called Translation. Um, the poems that I continue uh, with uh, are rather short. I decided to make a selection of shorter poems. So um, if I overdo uh, uh, the time, or if I become too lengthy, please let me know. I will immediately stop the number of poems I'm going to read. So translation is a, a poem I wrote, I don't know, maybe 20 years ago, and it has been translated in many languages and uh, published in various magazines all over the world. So there it is, my, my statement on, on translation. Word by word, I translate the dead into living, bones into meat, winters into summer, Mole hills into mountains. I shed the snake's skin, tailor angel's wings. I am the word's judge who remains unseen within the text. I sleep on a pillow of someone else's dreams. I wake up to a good morning in dead tongues. I translate day into night the past into present, oblivion into memory, today into tomorrow, but did not anticipate the cruel desiccating act, the fact that with every translated breath, I lose my very own, spend myself, waste myself unknowingly, floating word by word into another context. So now I'm expected to transport the thirsty across the river without getting wet, without being quenched. I neither have the breath, nor words, nor hands to translate my own pain into sadness, happiness, plenitude, stop, enough. That's the poem uh, uh, translation, which I, as I said, wrote long time ago, but it's still quite, quite on demand as I've already said. Uh, I will continue with, uh, as I said, other poems from my early collections of uh, poems. Uh, the next one is uh, entitled Survival, which was written, uh, I think, during those horrible political crises before Yugoslavia painfully fell apart. So the poem is uh, called Survival. <clears throat> Having exhausted every possibility of any future at this time, rejecting it like an empty shell, like a used rubber, we set off in search of a surrogate self. But the past is a yoke impossible to deal with, an absolute controversy, a civilized invention to unify views, to channel thoughts and wash brains a biological need of oxen. The past is a dead quote, a transcript, a carrion we devour like vultures, each tugging at its own piece, scared lest we lose ourselves 
lest our corpuscles blacken, lest our sight desiccate and our brood perish. Every possibility is exhausted. The heroes are weary, decimated, the search unavailing. Silently, covertly, we retreat into the shadow of our skins, into our cocoons for permanent hibernation. All right, then a poem of transition, as I, as I usually call it. It's called Between Two Worlds. I usually do not comment on my, on my poems because if I add any comment uh, before reading them, I feel like squeezing their soul out of them. So between two worlds, lost between two worlds, one dead, the other incapable of being born, with neither, with neither brow nor nape. So little brain is left per capita, so little sense in this domain of ragged crags and years of drought. Headless, but at the head of eunuchs and petty minds, uh, someone said, acorns ahead as deep as light. We sleep the night in the camp of previous wretches, full of, sh full of sheep droppings and mercurial waste. We wait for the ferryman to ferry us across for free to the misty shore that end of our hope, to salvation, final fall, to the end that our salvation is or is not. Is a very short poem. Uh, my little me. When I fenced in my little me and said to myself, this is mine, it grew became my dictator, handsome and greedy. Now I prepare for rebellions, ambushes. I plot evil, I hire traitors, assassins. But in fact, as the lowest of all serviles, I grovel before its feet and flatter, salivating at its throne. Uh, two poems on, on the theme of migration. Uh, written before those great migrations happened during the past 10 years or so. The first one is called On Leading. It is time to gather all my years, to pack them neatly, not mix them up, to ensure the house against far off misfortune, to gather in all the mountains and confluences, to fold up the false frontiers, to memorize all signs and then destroy them. So as somewhere in some other time to reconstruct my ID. I depart decisively, not knowing in whose dream this journey happened, asking myself, what is this life if not a painful setting off into the unknown, beyond the sunset and the rainbow's end, out with the borders of consciousness and knowledge towards the secret of what we are not, into a dream of falling stars, whence the winds bring us new islands, uninhabited like cells. And the uh, sequel to it, immigrant talent. Isn't this skin enough for us that we naturally, according to need, ourselves cast? then trudge like tramps, wander the world infected with polyglossia, struck down by the Babylonian virus, a circus. We forget the taste of our mother's milk and the labor pains of our first words. And what if we know for sure the head of the Delta when the flow is everything, spring, confluence, consolation, excitement, and diving into the fleeting essence a nonsense. Faceless, we search for the footprints, echoes of our laughter and our poverty, our weeping and our wealth. Day in, day out, dig ditches, graves the time fills up, planting them with sharp spears to prevent our return. Uh, and of course, the major disease of all our civilizations and the previous civilizations 
a poem which is called History. When the moon is a peeled orange, dripping heavy at night, Minerva, the owl, flies away blindly into darkness, careful, pedantic, joyfully listening to every murmur of the previous day, following every spasm in dreams, overhearing every sigh of love, quietly, without disturbing anything, and with satellite precision, attacks her victims. During the day when the sun is a dazzling cauldron, tintinabulating across the sky, when we are in haste, unable to greet each other, when we have no time to see one another or to see who is there or missing, she's resting at ease in its burrow, masticating, consuming her prey. All right, from more recent uh, collections, I decided to uh, read a couple of poems from a sequence of poems called Night Houses. It goes together with the immigrants' poems uh, very well because whole villages in, in, in various parts of Macedonia uh, have been left deserted uh, during the past several decades. Uh, when I say whole villages, I mean literally there is no one there. So the houses and everything there in them is falling apart. And it's a very sad thing to, to see houses uh, being completely deserted and sentenced to death. Night houses. Uh, this is the Brightshina house in the vicinity of Prespa, the lake district in Macedonia. And this is how it goes. Jagdaws stirring in the roof of this house are the natural hairs of the darkness there. But echoes still sound in the rooms below. Shawl, heavy women walking in clogs, their muffled weeping at births and burials. The green bread of absence waits on the table. The gate is latched with curses and spells. Relentless wasps crack the mud brick walls. Ivy woven from shadows covers the windows, claims the door, crumbles the swallow's nest. A rusty chain hangs from the chimney's neck, the blackened pot forgotten in the hour frightens away generations yet to be born. They fly to high spring, shedding its milky snow. The second night house is uh, 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 an image which uh, I uh, uh, found in the village of the Polish in central Macedonia, completely deserted, not, not just the village, the whole region, several villages there. Years of Pestilence inhabit the house, and not a whisper of comfort or prayer. The last family moved out ages ago, packing their poverty and fire, leaving it desolate as a dead star. The rosette crafted on the ceiling, bats twitter in blind testimony to the exchange between day and night. In this house where such binary oppositions differ like a pair of identical twins, the fireplace ties with forgetfulness. No memory of those crackling flames, those baked offerings dully set on the sunlit foundation stone between hopes and the lone blessings. In this house, despairs a well of wishes. It's a ruin, the shelter to homeless aliens. The empty promises of past generations now fill the stony yard with wild herds blossom beside fresh and alluring. I stand as if before a deserted kingdom, introspective as a ship stranded in a bottle and quiet, despite glass pierced in its body, its nose. I too will embark on a secret course, an undiscovered island of happiness. A poem uh, which I sketched uh, uh, another uh, lighthouse, uh, the western part of Macedonia, a mountainous village which is also uh, deserted. It had only one inhabitant for quite some time, but the poor lady died a couple of years ago. So it's completely deserted now. 
A small pool of fledgling rays rises in the eastern window from which the thirsty ghosts of the house would keenly drink. High on the sounds of wedding, a splendid spring rainbow unfurled in the southern window, shares the day with royal butterflies. A distant song of the harvesters curls in the western window. They crumble morsels of ripe sun in bowels full of water and vinegar. The northern window suffers from heights and snow blindness. Each winter, we cast a favorable spell and seal its eyes with spells. All right, a few uh, poems uh, that I would like to read. Not all of them, perhaps I'll choose a couple of them. Uh, I call these poems poems of deep image. Okay? The first one is morning. Gray drizzle and dew prowling through chill chambers of exile. The morning is unrest, an unsure stroke on the window's canvas. Wake up, as before, in the feathers of your fluttering dream and start your vigil. Wake up and wait for the call of the dimmed stars now gathered under the rings of tarded rocks, dripping from the tattered sky. The second one is also related to morning, and it's called stale morning. A stale morning. The air outside dies of sorrow for the air inside. Obstinate as beggars, the hills extend dirty palms for a crumb of warm mildness. But the day is a sleeping lake, dribbling streams of cold saliva. The early birds sound their lament over the stillborn day. It's quiet like a nameless grave or an abandoned house. The shadows of the aspens scurry to the, to the river banks like long fingered thieves. I urge my heels to conjure a step that of this, out of this ugly dream, to be out in summer's radiance when the morning tastes of a mother's warm nest. All right, uh, evening poem, evening rhapsodies, uh, two part poem, a diptych, a lyrical nocturne, that is. What do these dust birds sing, gliding with glacial eyes to the sunset of this marble world, riding above the dark woods, tired flocks of trail starry wings, which worry over the world, wave like lovers' arms, which tenderly, all night, shape an irreplaceable presence. Silence, guileful like a guillotine. If only we could conceive whatever divides us from the sky, be it hatred or malice, fear or courage, as a song on this all right, I'll skip that poem and uh, uh, move on to two dedications, uh, unusual titles. The first one is, He Who Puts a Shoe Under His Pillow. He who puts a shoe under his pillow dreams of untraveled roads in untrodden expanses of sand and untouched oases of flowers. He preaches peace at the crossroads and smells of spring words that never enter the agenda of the angry parliaments of birds. He dreams of undrawn maps where letters have no access, of smooth slices of bread never bitten by rotten teeth, and of a handful of clear water not kissed by thirsty lips that sing, oh necessity, you who have a face, you who have all the faces, he who puts a shoe under his pillow has a fair cheek and leaves no trace of his face on anything that remained without a name. And the second one in the same sequence, 
he who carries grains of sand. He who carries grains of sand in his shoe is a son of desert wind that conjure impossible sights for the eye from the dreams of troglodytes these days. The things he hasn't done trace him doggedly and set ambushes in pure light where all is dead, yet nothing dies. The grains of sand sing a song with no echo along the rippling plain, knowing no gratitude, feeling no responsibility for the ancient air in the mirages. He who carries grains of sand in his shoe from one desert to another swarms bees in his footprints and yearns for the amber light of the oasis. Uh, from the uh, book which was awarded the National Award for Poetry, a poem, La Vita Nuova, after Dante. title. It's too simple to surrender to the wind in an hour when nothing changes, in a moment when you might say, I was born in a cradle that suffered from warm eaten images. I grew up in years that rose from the bunkers of rebels' tales, beyond the visions of wise men who once knew the formula of passion. I matured in the secret of human pain, in the silent growth of kingdoms, along the extending world's waves, that even now as I grow old, take my breath away and the right to a failing future that leaves only an inheritance of stars. Now you write the scriptures of fallen belfries and minarets, of nocturnal houses over thick sheet music of smoke. Your best readers are doctors of silence executed long ago by a barrage of solid falsely nestled between time's overlapping hands and the infinite reflected in the mirrors at crossroads. Uh, I'm, I'm close uh, my reading with uh, two strong songs, as I call them, okay? One is dedicated to uh, Thomas Transtroma when he came to the School of Poetry Evening Festival and uh, in this wonderful Cathedral Church, uh, Byzantine, early Byzantine, uh, I mean, Byzantine, 11th century uh, cathedral, played piano a sonata for, he, for uh, the left hand as uh, he had a stroke and couldn't, couldn't uh, move both hands. That was time. such a moving event. I remember yeah. it. it well, so yeah, moving. I was so moved by this act yeah. that, I, that I wrote a poem dedicated to, to Thomas. And this is, how, this is how it goes. We forged and riveted a night with stars for your lovely left-handed piano sonata, which bewildered the pale angel in Saint Sophia. We hatched a blue day for the swallows that would carry your image until evening over the lake embroidered with silken threads. We presented a warbling river remind us that we're also naked and pristine water imprisoned in a body of dust and time. We have already outlived our use by date, but there's not a generation in sight to understand the look in the angel's eye, to embrace the harmony of bird's wings, to appreciate the current of your speech that springs from your strong song. And the last uh, uh, strong song, as I call it, is dedicated to a student of mine who uh, was doing his PhD on translation. Uh, and he died uh, of bone cancer immediately after he finished a splendid, miraculous translation of Moby Dick in Macedonia. Mm. Work in progress for Roman chemistry, as he said, by pretty young. Only death, my dear friend, is accomplished successfully. All else is a work in progress. Music, painting, building, art. And the word that gives them life and meaning is incomplete. In well, that will be it. Thank you very much for your attention. Bravo, bravo.
Thank you. Thank you so much for those strong songs indeed, Zoran. And what an astonishing poem to end with. Yeah, just really. Thank you, Anna. I hope you enjoy it. Yes, too. Why yeah. I present it? Oh, very much. And actually, I wanted to ask you straight away, very boringly, I have to go at the top of the hour. Um, I have a, another Zoom meeting. But yeah. I wanted to very selfishly ask you, um, do you have a sense of being a public poet in the sense of being a spokesperson for Macedonian history and culture? <laughs> You know, I mean, alongside you, you're this great specialist in Amer American poetry and contemporary, you know, English, you know. Yeah, but well, I book. mean, public, public poet or public figure, I don't know, public poet, maybe in the past 10 years as a poet. I was uh, better known as, uh, as an activist in the field of literature, translator, right? Uh, although my books fared very well, you know, but uh, having lots of students, hundreds, a year, more than that. Uh, people knew me better as the teacher you know, <laughs> rather than the poet. Uh, but I don't know if I gave up teaching, perhaps I would have become a better known poet myself, right? <laughs> so at the moment, I, I, I reckon I, I, I fare well in both, uh, in both positions as a public poet and as a, as a, as an, as a person who contributes a lot to the uh, uh, literary uh, events in Macedonia. I'm also uh, the current president of Macedonian Pen, which is a great struggle as well. Ah, so, so another pen. Yeah, yeah another pen president. Another pen. <laughs> All right. So Zoran, I want to ask you, because a lot of the new poems I haven't actually read before. And they're mm -hmm. astonishing, um, especially that entire sequence of the depopulated lands, yeah. the, the villages that have been, you know, yeah, but a, structurally, mm -hmm. structurally, what I see is you're talking about very sparse spaces, mm -hmm. but your poems have become very, very densely packed. You know, the phrases are really dense and they're also very symmetrical, four or five lines each stanza, yeah. very different from the other poetry you've written before and maybe a couple of the poems you've written later. So mm -hmm. is this dichotomy, was, was it conscious or is it a phase that you're going through? Because it's very different from anything else I've read before. Right, I mean, this uh, sequence of poems uh, just happened. I, mean, I, I decided to visit those places that I haven't uh, uh, had visited before. So when you visit such places which are haunted by spirits of those who live, I mean, whole villages, they're still there, you know, but empty, completely empty. There's not even animals <laughs> over there wandering about. And um, you notice more. There's so many details that you see and uh, that remain stuck in your mind. Uh, such details that, uh, that, uh, that uh, I think matter a lot to a poet's eye. And uh, I decided in this whole sequence of poems to, to uh, make more visual presentations, um, poems which move on images rather than on ideas. Right? Therefore, I believe that uh, the images should be very clear cut, very well presented, okay? and uh, um, not tinged with ideas or, or you know, uh, whatever, uh, let's call it uh, commentaries. They would stand, stand distinctly on their own and move the poem on their own uh, by means of their own power, uh, as suggested. It seems like the same sort of sensibility and kind of coming into detailed awareness of this, well, certainly this aspect of Macedonianness of, you know, the film Honeyland, which oh, yeah. you know, has, oh, yeah. has brought those kinds of landscapes mm. to a wide attention. Very much so, although my, my book was written before. I was going <laughs> to say, because I was going to say, easy yeah, to yeah. moment in the culture yeah, yeah. where kind of reclaiming what it is to be Macedonian in a different way. Or, exactly, mm. especially when you visit such deserted places, which once were thriving with life, okay, packed with, uh, with life, uh, throbbing with, with new life as well. And now when you see them deserted, I think that your, your, your observation becomes uh, much more focused to see details that you normally would not see in, in places which are overcrowded with people. You know, so, I don't know. And the silence, the, the, the weighing silence upon you uh, makes you very focused on observe, observing things. 
yeah, so that's how it happened. All three of you have landscape in your work, but in yeah. such different ways, my goodness. You know, such different poetic ways and also such different representational symbolic ways, you know, doing something different and spoken very differently, spoken for or from very differently. Yeah, I mean, uh, nature is all about it, be it spoiled or ruined or <laughs> destroyed, but still, I mean, a poet must find a way to deal with, with it. And uh, of course, it, it needs to be uh, constantly uh, refreshed uh, when being presented in, in poetry. Otherwise, if we carried on with the romantic presentation of nature, what would happen to, to poetry nowadays? You know? So, uh, but it, it's a challenging always to find a new, new aspect of, of looking at it you know, because it's all always there. So, um, uh, poetry is exactly about that, I mean, bringing fresh. Uh, always fresh aspects on, on looking at things. I think I think this whole idea of unpeeling and mm. finding something anew, yeah. fresh, as you say, it has also so has to do so much with your own introspective journey as a person. Clearly, yeah, and I see that across all the three poets. You know, of course, Zoran, I know your poetry very very well. We've translated each other's work as well. Yeah. Uh, but I was also thinking like. Uh, Fiona mentioned this whole idea of, say, um, the national, not national poet, but spokesperson oh. for the culture. Yeah. So th there are there are phases I now see in your poetry where you are actually so so invested in this uh, the whole idea of Macedonian identity, where now you are probably more comfortable and you're talking about. Macedonian identity very, very deeply and anchored, and it's anchored in language because you're talking about these villages which are so Macedonian. I mean, I remember a film which you introduced me to. Was it what? What was it called? Before the rains, the the, the rain. after, after the, the rain. rain, after the rains. Uh, Some uh, of the poetry, you know, before, painted before that before landscape. The before, yeah. the before, before the rain, before the rains, about the war. Yeah. Yeah. Masterful, masterful. And there you go, the, the landscapes there are uh, mind blowing, really. I mean, but mind that's blowing. Funny. it's a small yeah. country, but it's really beautiful when it comes to the landscapes and uh, differences in terms of nature and uh, both the lowlands and the mountains. Uh, wonderful place. So it deserves, <laughs> you know, to be looked at uh, differently by any new generation of poets. It's so, I mean, challenging. And also, as you said, uh, to to, uh, uh, as a material, the material of poetry doesn't change, I would say, but language changes, language of poetry changes. And uh, uh, when, when you present a material which was presented centuries ago by other poets, then you must find a different way. You must invent new language to look at the, the same material, you know, with different eyes and uh, phrase it in different wording and find another language for, for it, which will communicate better. And as I said before, in a new, fresh way, what has been known to us I mean, generally speaking for ages now. Mm. It's a tremendous sense of um, uh, questions about the the obligations and the roles and the possible roles for poetry um, this afternoon. I think that uh, for men are too. There's a sense of really being part of. Yeah, culture building um, a national identity that's shifting you know in and through her work as well as her addressing it and for Jordi um this very interesting question about how Spanish is Spanish and um and your own I for me quite unique but also quite bifurcated sensibility and and then for Zora and like Mena this this wonderful sense of um addressing a kind of addressing the tribe it's not just purifying the dialect it's speaking up for the tribe and it's a it's a very for someone in a densely overcrowded country like my own um it's very ex where nobody reads poetry it's a joy to see poetry to remember that poetry can have such a a public non-denominational role in a way um, I'm going to say my thank yous now because I have to go, I'm afraid. I have another meeting at six o'clock and I suspect that'll be true for many people. So I, from, right. from my part, I want to thank enormously Mena Elvin, Jordi Doce and Zoran Lanchevsky. Naturally, I want to thank Shadeep um, and Don, my partners in crime 
and thank you everyone who who's come and listened and who comes and listens every month it's a joy conclave is always a joy it's so inspiring and exciting let's do it all again on the second tuesday of may thanks very much thank you so much thank you yes thanks